Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 92 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook. And what we're going to be talking about this week, it's a bit of a mouthful, this title, Bob, but it's a good one. The use of curiosity in the search for connection in the therapy process. Oh, what a lovely title. I love the titles that you're you're in charge of the titles. I'm here as your sidekick. <laughs> and I always have most of the titles, don't I? Yeah. I love the titles that you bring, and I have no idea what's going to come up when we start talking about them. Oh gosh, yes. I do. Curiosity I think... is a good one. Curiosity, I like that. Yeah. So, I think connection, attachment, relationship. They're all very, very important in terms of enabling the client to feel safe, secure, yeah. and attached. And without that, really, therapy is much harder to achieve. Yeah. And curiosity, to me, <clears throat> is quite a gentle way of inquiring. It, that, that's what I think about when I think about curiosity. It's not like the third degree. It's not putting the spotlight on them. <laughs> no, I hope not. I think curiosity is a lovely world, and it is a it is a gentle description. I think um, it it needs to be. Um, how can I explain this? I think therapists need to cultivate the curiosity, and if they haven't got curiosity for the human mind, the human spirit. Uh, the, the changes that people need in front of them, the understanding of the human condition, then they're in the wrong job. Yeah, I agree. That's and there's serious. something about curiosity as well that says we haven't always got all the answers. We need to be curious. Mm -hmm. We need to be curious. We need to explore. Yeah. We need to inquire. We need to account for the person in front of us. I, and it's no wonder I like that as a a value um, in therapy because I'm a detective addict. Yeah. <laughs> so you can put me through Mrs. Marple, uh, Sherlock Holmes, Hercule Poirot, you know, all the, the detective people. Uh, I, and especially I'm an Agatha Christie person. Yeah. yeah. And I go down to Torquay almost every year. And we go up the Dart, the, the River Dart, and we, and I, I, as you go up there, you've got Agatha Christie's house um, on the left-hand side. So, and they down there in Torquay, they do Agatha Christie trails, wow. and they in the theatres they have Agatha Christie um, plays, usually Hercule Poirot or something like that. Um, yeah. And uh, I'm a detective by nature. And I think that really to do the job as a therapist, you need to be a detective. You know, you need to help decode, uh, help the client decode what's usually un understandable for them. Yeah. That's, that's a really good way of putting it, is to decode things. To help them um, usually be aware of what is so challenging of them to be aware of. And it's usually un understandable to them yeah that's that's uh past the scrabble word i know scrabble word is seven when i was younger i used to play with my mother's scrabble and we used to have 12 letters so it would have fitted <laughs> instead of the seven uh so it would have fitted into an un understandable would have fitted into the scrabble process but seriously you need to help the client decode because they are so stuck in their stuck in their script or their default way of um, surviving the yeah. quiet thing. they need somebody who is a, a breaker of codes yeah and I think as well because we're detached from things we can see the code a bit clearer mm. 
I I know for me, I can't decode my own stuff a lot of the time because I'm I'm too emotionally involved or attached to it. So I need somebody mm. outside to look in to to point things out to me. Absolutely, and I think therapists that find difficulty in cultivating curiosity are the therapists that get caught up in a rigid way of thinking, and they think this is the only way um, the change can happen, or this is the only model you can use to help the client change. And if yeah. they get stuck in what's right and what's wrong, uh, they they lose the art of spontaneity and curiosity. Is that when our ego gets in the way, Bob? That this is the only way that yeah, yeah, we can not, get yeah. to cure or whatever. Yeah, or when they get very yes, the answer is that. Or when the therapist gets very precious uh, with the model they've been trained in. Yeah. For example, and they don't, or they're unable to see that uh, there's another way to help the therapist. Yeah. Or there could be other ways. So, uh, and as I said, the problem with that is it blocks curiosity and blocks spontaneity because the therapist gets fixed in a certain outcome. Yeah. Yeah, because every client is unique. They might come with the same issues, but their upbringing and their experience and everything is unique about them. So we, we need to be able to look at different things. Yeah, I definitely flexibility, spontaneity, curiosity. Yeah, These are the most important qualities. Because if you had a tool bag for your thirty-eight year career, or however long your career is, Bob, what would be in that tool bag? Because for oh, me, wow. if something tweaks my interest and I want to learn more about it, so. I've, you know, everything apart from the kitchen sink is in mine. Oh, oh. And, you know, it's it's an evolution through through my career to, to pick up and, and do different things. But your your tool bag must be overflowing. Yes, it is. But, you know, it's a lovely metaphor. And for you to have that way of thinking, that shows that you're, you have an abundance of curiosity. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if it tweaks my curiosity, then I want to learn more. And of course, you know, we need to be curious about the person in front of us. We need to want to understand what's brought them to the therapy office. What's what is it that they want to change, and how come they haven't been able to do that already? Yeah, we we need to, you know, develop that quality of curiosity, and. The other thing about curiosity is that the client will feel accounted, you know, accounted by you, that you're on their side, that you see them as valuable, that you are willing to go the extra mile and invest your own heart and passion into the work in front of you. Yeah, because you're taking the time to be curious and to inquire. Oh, oh. And, and fact, it, there's something else as well about not making assumptions if we're curious we're we're not making assumptions about what we think they need or should do or all those sorts of things as well no you're right and we're checking things out yeah oh. you're right uh, uh, and uh the worst thing for a therapist to to um get caught up in is black and white thinking, right and wrong, certain way of being, and you mentioned it, by the way, assumptions. Yeah. Very hard for a therapist to train themselves to move away from assumptions. But if you get caught up in that process of assumptions, you will uh, miss the client in front of you automatically. Yeah, as you were talking, then I was, I was thinking, I can understand, and I probably did do it when I was newly qualified, being quite rigid in what we were going to do in the sessions, and you know, if they're coming with anxiety, then we need to do X, Y, and Z. 
because I didn't have the confidence to be curious or to look outside the box or to explore anything else. But as as you, you get more confidence in it, it, it's easier to say I don't have all the answers. <laughs> yeah, I think you've got a very good point, uh, and it's a developmental point. Yeah. That, oh, it's a developmental perspective. In other words, when you start off as a beginning therapist, usually you start off with your placement and training, and you get clients through the placement. Secondly, you then go on to um, go into private practice and build your practice up. So in these early years as you're evolving, you usually, it's very normal this, the therapist gets very wedded to the psychotherapy model they've been trained in. Yeah. And to rights and wrongs. Yeah. What's right and what's wrong. Yeah. And kind of following a manual, if you will, that this, yeah. this is what we do. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's almost like therapy by rote, unfortunately. Yes. Because, you know, and the, I think the reason is, it's because it soothes the anxiety of the therapist. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, did, it did with me. I can remember having sheets and pages and pages of things, you know, in preparation. Mm. And talking to other therapists who were much more experienced would just walk into the therapy room and I can remember being in awe of what with nothing's planned you've not got anything planned you just walk in and they were like yeah <laughs> and that has to come with experience yeah it's developmental you can't just suddenly get to that place you know experience confidence the ability to develop curiosity the freedom from anxiety all comes later in your practice as you develop and get the experience and solidify you know security in yourself to allow yourself that freedom yeah so curious curiosity i think is a developmental quality in the sense that you need to be free of anxiety to allow yourself to have that sense of spontaneity often to be curious yeah and I know we've touched on it in the past, and I think it's one of the titles that we've got coming up about, you know, making mistakes, you know, being curious and, you know, having spontaneity and everything. We've got to be open to getting it wrong sometimes, you know, asking questions and being curious kind of makes sure, and like you said, checking in that we're, we're on the right track with what we're doing. And beginning therapists um, usually are mortified if they uh, feel they have made a mistake or if they got things right and wrong. Yeah. And again, it takes experience to move away from that position. Of, uh, I can remember in the early days, you know, and I don't know whether it was you or, or one of the other trainers in the Institute, you know, being really worried that I was going to damage the client. If I didn't get it right 100% of the time, I'm going to harm them in some way and it, it was a real fear of mine in the early days i think it's very common with early therapists yeah and the real truth of course if you've got a good working relationship where the client feels valued accounted for and validated um they will be able to cope with most ruptures you know ruptures in the psychotherapy process they're repairable yeah so the relationship you know the therapist can grow from any you know chat mistakes if you want to put it that way a person makes um but again i think it's a developmental process where the therapist needs to be to have grown in that process to feel confidence to allow themselves to be free of anxiety and to be spontaneous and to inquire and account and allow their curiosity to really have free reign yeah i think that's so easy at the beginning but you see, on, that's true. On another side of this, um, in my experience, you get some therapists who are much more curious, almost from the beginning. It's in their nature yeah. to be curious, to be adventurous, to take risks, to explore, to want to understand the process. And will ask many, many senses, many questions from a curious place than other therapists, for example. 
Yeah. So I think even though the developmental perspective, um, you have to be able to see that the therapist comes from that sense of passion and curiosity rather than therapy by rote. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you know, like you said, being curious kind of allows for connection between the therapist and the, the client as well. Yeah, that, that's where I'm going with that. Because if a person feels accounted for, validated, and valued, and feels that the therapist is on their side, yeah, uh, the therapist has got passion for, you know, the, the the client getting better, and they're they're curious to find out what went right wrong, then connection is much 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 more likely to happen. Mm. And once you get connection, you'll get relationship. Once you get a relationship, that will foster the template of security and safety. And once you have security and safety, that will foster trust. And the relation will be much more solid um, for the journey ahead, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. And that if a rupture does occur, that, you know, you potentially you can mend it if you've got all of that in place, you know, along the way. So all those things that we've been talking about aids connection and connection is the building block for a good relationship mm -hmm. and a good relationship is a building block for effective psychotherapy yeah so they sort of all go together yeah and again i know we've touched on it in the past but we have an innate need for connection with other human beings it, mm. i often say to to clients it's not that you know it's nice and it's you know it'd be good if we had it it's it's a need in us to have a connection with with other people yeah we have a need an innate need for social relationships yeah well the human person is by definition social yeah and unfortunately any connection is better than no connection <laughs> well uh, yes that's absolutely true absolutely true um even by you know how can I explain this? We we search out negative connection. If there's no, it's better than having no connection. Yeah, yeah. And and so I think I think I think it's very important for therapists to think of therapy, you know, in terms of connection. Uh, transaction analysis is what I trained in is a contact and connection oriented model. Yeah. And curiosity. I think builds the connections. If you're not, if you're not curious, if you don't inquire, if you don't um, have the passion to look at what brought, you know, how come the person came into your therapy room, then the client will feel uh, less valuable. Um, yeah. The connection will be harder to foster. And when you were talking earlier on about being a detective that's sometimes what it's like because for the client they know everything about their life so it's like it's very mundane for them because they've been a part of it whereas you know for us to inquire and to be curious and to peel back the layers and to to work out the little nuances and everything that takes time like you said you know to foster the connection and the relationship and curiosity is a is a quality which needs cultivating yeah and the therapist needs to put energy into that and it comes with passion and it comes with the desire for social connection and it comes with the desire to understand how come the person sabotages their own life mm. and they all go together if that's not there usually the client will feel the therapist not is not interested in them. Yeah, and and that's if, a, that's a big thing, isn't it? Mm. Well, yeah. do you want a therapist? Does any client want a therapist that's not interested in them? And in fact, the clients that stay with a therapist that they feel is not interested in them will be the clients who've had a history of caretakers that has not been interested in them, and they have a script 
where, where they believe that that's their norm. And of course, that is no template for change. No. It's a template for repeating history. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, in life, I would, I, you know, I, none of us want to be with somebody that isn't interested in us. That, that's correct. Unless, as I've just said, you've had a history yeah. where take, caretakers have not been interested in you. So you've switched off, you've dissociated, you've tried to cope in another way and you, you don't know any different. Yeah. So you, you may then pick people who have the same pattern uh of disconnection or purveying you know uh disinterest and therefore you may unfortunately expect or not be surprised when your therapist does the same process however i think that uh it that will not lead to effective psychotherapy no that will lead to a repeat of history for the client yeah. and actually probably a repeated history for the therapist as well yeah i can't i can't imagine a scenario where a therapist would not be interested in their client well i can i'll give you <laughs> and and actually what should happen in the training is that the person who starts off from that position is persuaded to go to therapy to explore how come they have chosen a profession which they're not interested in, which is really uh, may often be the case, or then don't realize that they are putting over an attitude of disinterest. So the therapy is the first call. The second call is that the trainers need to, you know, help the prospective trainee to be aware that they are putting over an attitude of disinterest and why that is. Um, so hopefully and usually um a trainee therapist won't finish the course from that position yeah um and they'll then go and look at you know their own therapy process and how come they're coming into a profession which you know needs the therapist to have some passion and change it, it, I, mean, it, I uh, suppose there's a fine line as well in curiosity as you were talking then i was thinking I'm too nosy to be disinterested, but then there's a fine line in being curious and being, you know, nosy <laughs> and wanting to know everything about every part of the, the client's life and intrusive. Well, I, ah, well, that's a different thing, isn't it? I mean, you're now onto an important thing to mention. If the client feels that you're intrusive to the extent that you just said, they probably will feel overwhelmed and switch off. Uh -huh. So even though curiosity and the cultivation of curiosity, I believe to lead to an effective relationship and therefore an effective road to change, there's a difference between gentle curiosity and inquiry to uh, intrusive uh, processes or where the other person feels interrogated yeah i mean i think there's a difference in those two processes yeah definitely the person will if they feel if they feel interrogated if they feel their life is been intruded on without a contract or without some sort of process then effective therapy will not happen either yeah and for me you know, I can think of, of times in the past where maybe I have gone past of being curious, but I've picked up on a change in the client's behaviour. You know, then maybe being more defensive or the disconnect happens because I've obviously overset the mark and they didn't want to talk about where I was heading or something. Yeah, I, 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 and another good way to look at this is um think about personality adaptations or personality traits yeah so for example somebody who's, who's withdrawn as a default process or or as a way of surviving the world or coping yeah. with the world um is very different from somebody who's paranoid as a way of coping with the world or someone's who's 
hysterical, sees the world through feelings as a way of coping with her world. And I think you need to take into account the clinical aspect of the person in front of you. Yeah. When we're talking about, you know, your levels of curiosity. Yeah. Because it may be too much for the person who's, you know, got a process of withdrawing or feeling overwhelmed. Yeah. I'm thinking when you're talking about that, the, the client, and I have had them in the past that dip in and dip out they can connect for a, a period of time but then they withdraw and then they come back and they kind of mm. yeah constantly dipping in and out mm. Mm. so i think you need to think about whether your transactions may be too overwhelming yeah even though you may think they're simply curiosity questions they may actually be too many or too intense yeah. or they may be transactions which aren't contracted for. Yeah. yeah. All those things. So I think we need to think clinically as well, you know, when we're talking about the quality of curiosity and inquiry, we need to think yeah. clinically. And that there's a point to it. We're not just being nosy. Oh, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no. No, you're completely right. You would do some educative therapy. But, you know, so you do have to think clinically. And I still think that if a person feels accounted for, mm. validated, and feels they are of some value, effective psychotherapy and connection is more, more likely to happen. Mm -hmm. If they feel that the therapist is disinterested in some way, or doesn't want to understand them. Yeah. Or, I don't know, intellectualizes rather than goes towards the heart of the matter. They may, an effective psychotherapy is far likely to happen, I think, because the relationship uh, will be much more fragile between the therapist and the client. Yeah. Now, in TA, they've got that whole theory about strokes positive strokes, negative strokes, conditional yeah. strokes. Um, a stro for people who perhaps don't know, TA, a, stro a positive stroke is a stroke of recognition. Negative stroke is a, stro a unit of negative recognition. So you've got positive recognition, negative recognition, and people thrive on positive recognition. Now, if, the, if they feel unrecognized by the client, then effective relationship building becomes much more harder yeah and again you know it's what they're used to in their past as well if they're used to getting negative strokes as opposed to positive strokes you know when we start to give them positive strokes it can be overwhelming at times if we're you know piling them on mm -hmm. so it's about being in the moment with the clients and noticing any changes and, and then being curious about how did that make you feel? You know, when I said that to you, I, I get a sense that you're not used to hearing oh. positive oh. statements. Oh. And again, just be curious about it. Yeah, it, 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 yeah absolutely right. Um, and also a positive intention to understand the process with the client is important here yeah and again the client's going to feel accounted for but you are right that's a really important tip we've been talking about it for the last 10 minutes is we need to think clinically and check out if we think we're overwhelming the person in front of us yeah because we are all different you know and, and like you said if if you know the default is to withdraw or to to not have that connection all the time i know for you know for some clients having eye contact can be quite overwhelming particularly when they're talking about you know quite deep things they'll they'll look away they'll look over me or the side of me as opposed to looking at me because that that's too intense for them so quite right, rightly you might check out what's happening for them yeah yeah that particular time or at least help them be aware of the process that's happening in the room 
yeah without shaming them or anything <laughs> which again can be quite a, a big thing in the therapy room if we point something out we need to be mindful of doing it gently which is why I like curiosity because it's not intrusive it's just being curious yes that's the that's in our dialogue between you and me hopefully a lot of the podcasts we all know what curiosity means yeah but it's easily mistaken I think for other things so for example a therapist who always asks a lot of questions may think that's being curious and actually the client may feel it as interrogation mm. so curious curiosity for one person might be different from another person in terms of definition but i i think that it it is a gentle transaction it's a transaction of inquiry it's a transaction aimed at understanding yeah it's a transaction aimed at relationship building yeah i think we could in in life in general we could all do with being a little bit more curious rather than making assumptions and presuming and all those sort of things i think curiosity would take us all a bit further in connections <laughs> yeah and i think checking out the, with the person in front of us what's happening if you feel them moving away from disconnection yeah away from curiosity because they might actually be sensing or feeling you know curiosity is intrusive mm -hmm. so, if we're checking out the person in front of us, helping them be aware of their own process, then that's leading to building up an effective relationship, which then builds up to effective therapy. Yeah. I hope the people that are listening to this can kind of get a sense of what it's like to be a therapist. Because one of the criticisms that I hear a lot about therapy as opposed to counselling and coaching is the length of time that people are in therapy but when we're talking about the different layers of connection and taking into account you know the, the client and their experience and everything it does take time what's behind the criticism you said you hear a lot of criticism yeah yeah what's behind the criticism do just do, I, I don't know i always get a sense that, that you know we're, we're money grabbing and once they come in the door we don't want to lose them and that's why everything takes so long and it, it's like yeah you haven't got a clue really <laughs> well you know i i understand where you're coming from then you know but you see i think that for how can i i think for quite a lot lot of the time maybe even up to a year so that's going to be i don't know 50 sessions maybe let's yeah. just use that approximately um we're we're often seeing or experiences their behaviors mm. and we're often dealing with the impact of their behaviors on us or how the behaviors have got in the way of change or we're dealing with the adaptations uh, and that takes time to deal with plus the fact it takes time to understand a person's how a person's got to the way that it got to yeah it takes time for um us to you know pass that on to the client so all these things takes time now without that time uh being spent then a person may feel all the things i've been talking about in this podcast and the, and the relationship may not be built and robust enough to challenge to deal with the challenges that come underneath the behaviors see that's the key for me is what's underneath that's right unless you, you deal get, with that yeah you can get to the surface stuff quite quickly as soon as they walk in the first session you can get a sense of it but it's what's underneath that that that's takes right. the time yeah you're absolutely correct unless you can get to that and it takes time there's no yeah. other way around it because these are well constructed behaviors and defense systems that have worked for many years to have you know for the person to survive even though it isn't perhaps the way that they want to survive or it might be unhealthy or 
They may continue repetitively to do the same things. Unless you can get underneath that, if you just simply, I don't know, tell the person to change different behaviours and put lists of positive things on the fridge and follow those lists of things on the fridge. If you just change with, if you just stay with those behavioural changes, what will happen is the plaster will fall off. In other words, it's what's underneath the behaviours, what's underneath the plaster. So you need to get to the plaster, which has been the sort of way that people have sort of survived, you know, by putting a plaster on the hurt, the wound, the trauma. And like you've just said, you need to be able to get to what's bubbling around underneath all that, which is where the healing is. If you don't, behavioural change, in my, without anything else, in my opinion, will last a very short time. Yeah. And then what happens is they'll either carry on in their, you know, unhealthy mechanisms or they'll come back to therapy again because the real processes haven't been touched. And therefore, to do that, you need to have time. I agree. And be yeah. curious to get underneath the... The, the, you know the defenses that I love that word that's what we do we lay traps and put defenses up because people do yeah we you know we've learned to do that to protect ourselves it's all about survival so it takes time to I don't want to say knock down those defenses but to allow the client to take them down <laughs> in a safe and secure way it takes time yeah now one of the podcast titles I haven't zoomed over to you but, but it would be, uh, um, uh, you know, a challenge to therapy, really. And that is, um, is, mid, is therapy a middle class profession? So in other words, you know, when the challenge comes, people say, oh, you're just interested in money. And, you know, if they're there a year or whatever, it's very expensive. And we can do this in six sessions and XXX. In essence, that's true. Because A, we have to live, B, we spend a lot of money on the training, and C, um, you would just we have to pay you for our private practices and all the things that go with that. So unfortunately, you know, the therapist's time will you know, and their qualifications oh, yeah. will cost, and there's no way around that. If you and therefore it will accumulate over time, and that's why I said I was thinking about podcasts and middle classes and people who've got money are available, sorry, are able because they've got, you know, they've got that type of access to the financial processes that are needed for psychotherapy. By definition, um, we might want to say, unfortunately, this type of therapy is um, open to the middle classes more. And maybe that's a good podcast for us to do. I mean, I run a low cost clinic, as you know, but I only managed to do that because the people who are training will give their time voluntary for 50 minutes as a way of learning their, you know, it's like apprentice style, a way yeah. of learning their craft. And there are therapists who, who in private practice will have four or five of their clients maybe at a lower price. So it'd be a very good podcast to do. So, you know, I don't know where we go with this, except that therapy is by definition quite expensive. The longer it goes on, of course, it's more money. But, you know, Jackie, in the end, some things are priceless. I agree. I agree. Yeah. And you're paying for the skill and the training and the continuous professional development and 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 you know that's that's what costs the money yeah yeah so it's another podcast i know because i could talk for another hour about it but i think there is some truth by people who perhaps attack long-term psychotherapy to do with finance but i don't think that a majority of therapists go out of the way to lengthen the psychotherapy to simply get money no, not I at all. It takes time to build up a relationship. It takes time to look beyond the behaviours. It takes time to understand the person that we're actually dealing with. And, you know, change is a process, never an event. Yeah. 
So, Bob, we'll leave it there. Do you want to do that as the next topic? <laughs> Not this minute, no. Okay. But I, do, I would like to have it sometime. We will. I, I've written it down, so we will use that. So what we're going to discuss next... Well, let me just say one other thing, because I felt I was getting on my sort of preaching box there. I mean, 50 years ago, I did a politics degree, so I've always been interested in politics. And psychotherapy is where art and science meets. So... I have an investment in doing that podcast. I do want to end, though, by saying that I do believe curiosity leads, or that quality leads to um, trust, to authenticity um, in the relationship. And as the relationship gets more robust, therefore effective psychotherapy will happen. And by definition, that is long-term psychotherapy. Mm. Hard to do in six sessions. Yeah. I mean, curiosity can carry on in six sessions, but the relationship, you know, in six sessions. And the relationship and yeah. everything. Yeah, 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 definitely. So it's a podcast I would like to do, but I, I, ho I hope the, you know, listeners um, can see the importance of cultivating authenticity, trust, and curiosity in that process. Until next time, Bob. Yes, are you, we didn't answer your question. What do you think the next one is? What we're doing next time is understanding transactional analysis and how to use TA in the therapy process. Oh, you and I will love this. I hope the, I hope the listeners, <laughs> I hope the listeners enjoy it as much as probably we will um, talk about this because that's our major. <laughs> Be prepared. <laughs> so if we can't pass some tips about TA on. Uh, the next podcast, we never will. No. So until next time, Bob. Yes, certainly. Okay. Bye. Bye, Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.